the world is definitely in the beginning of a long-term energy crisis. Absolutely. In the beginning of a long-term long energy, energy crisis. crisis. Yes. So, 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 I mean, you know, we have energy available to us, but energy is becoming scarcer, less reliable and more expensive. Don't, but don't believe like your vehicles are clean. It's not as clean as we thought. But the assumptions behind that CO2 pricing scheme are wrong, unfortunately. For instance, wind and solar are not zero CO2. Hi Lars, let's talk about comets, right? We are in the middle of energy transitioning. False. False. But there have been tremendous energy transitions before. False. But for the past decade, we have been transitioning away from oil, coal, and gas. False. Okay, but at least we are moving away from coal. False. False. But then the future of Energy is wind and solar? False. Not true. Hmm. Is there anything true then about what we commonly hear about energy? Very little. What do you mean? There's very little true about what you hear in the common press about how energy works mm -hmm. and how the future of energy goes. Okay. So why are you saying false to all of these questions? Well, there is a myth about transition of energy or transition energy a myth about the past transition energy and the future transition energy in fact all we've been doing is adding energy mm -hmm. we use today the same amount of biomass we used 200 years ago actually probably more we are not transitioning we're only adding because we need so much more okay so we're not transitioning we're adding because there are more population today and and we become richer, we need more power energy per capita. Population is growing and the population is getting wealthier. And wealth is not possible without energy. That means the per capita consumption is going up. So it's a double whammy in terms of total energy requirement. All right. Have you ever asked ChatGPT or BART how fast are we transitioning away from coal? I have indeed. What did they say? Well, they gave the impression that we are transitioning away from coal, mm -hmm. which is incorrect. I think you should not be relying on anything when it comes to ChatGPT. You should always have to use your critical thinking on and like question, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. In general, it's a huge resource. And let's say when you ask ChatGPT, can you rewrite this sentence for me? That's amazing. Mm -hmm. But when you ask ChatGPT about data or about knowledge. what are the knowledge, uh -huh. you have to be very careful. So coal is so important in Indonesia. Explain Indonesia role in the global context. Well, roughly, we are consuming and producing worldwide about eight, eight and a half billion tons of coal per annum. Mm -hmm. Now, of this eight, eight and a half billion tons, roughly one, one and a half billion tons is what we call traded on seaborne markets. So it's basically purchased and sold, you know, by countries. And Indonesia makes up about 40 percent of global supply of coal when it comes to the seaborne trade. 40%. Wow. It's actually 40%. the single biggest exporter in the world. Have you um, been seeing a lot of power plants being shut down? So will you say that the supply and demand are right now quite disrupted? There is a lot of disruption worldwide. So especially in the Western world, power plants are shutting down. Mm -hmm. That is in Europe, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in the US, we have seen a shift from coal to gas. Mm -hmm. um, but in Asia, we have continuously been seeing new power plants coming online. Rightly so, because coal tends to be still the cheapest and most secure source of power. You trade a lot of coal, right? Do you trade in Indonesia or, or do you get the supply only from Indonesia? Or you just say like 40% of your trade comes from Indonesia? Indonesia is a very important market for us. So we've been here for 20 years. And I would say, yes, roughly, you know, that 30, 40% range is correct. Can we actually fulfill our energy requirement from the wind and solar? Um, well, 
wind and solar have increased their power capacity dramatically in the past years. And there will be huge, huge projects coming online in the mm -hmm. future. And there is the sense or the belief that number one, wind and solar are cheap. And number two, that wind and solar can provide us with the energy required for the future. Mm -hmm. I doubt both of those statements. I doubt both of those statements. I believe they will make up a certain part, but they cannot be the future of energy. They cannot be. So there will be just an additional to the increasing coal consumptions. Well, it's, it's oil, coal, gas, 80, 85% plus nuclear. Oil, coal, gas, nuclear, almost 90% of global mm -hmm. energy comes from that. We believe here in Indonesia, like we are talking so much about ESG. Um, we hear a lot about it as an investor. We tend to now these days, the millennials and the Gen Z's, we like to invest into the ESG funds, ESG um, products or ESG stocks. Does that make sense? Like in terms of the economic benefits? Like I, I, I want to know from your perspective on ESG? Well, let's take a step backwards. Number one, what's extremely positive is that in the past 10 years, there has been more focus on the envir environmental impact of what our life does. Mm -hmm. And our life starts with energy. Everything we have around us would not be here if we didn't have abundant, reliable, affordable energy available to us. But our life has a negative impact on the environment in many aspects. Mm -hmm. So the ESG movement has put that focus back onto people where people start thinking, hey, actually, hold on, what am I doing? Why do I have five cars? Why do I yes. have, you know, 10 laptops? Like, yes. What does it mean? Yes. So I think it's very important and very positive to start thinking about this. Yes. The problem is that ESG has been completely misused. Today, when people hear ESG, the majority of people think climate. But there's so much more, yeah. right? There's environment, mm -hmm. there's social, and there's governance, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and when it comes to the environment, the environment is not about CO2. CO2 is one element about climatic change, but there's so much more about the environment. And the problem for me is that how the pricing of CO2 or the focus on CO2 takes away the focus on so many other issues which are important to solve and would cost a fraction. But do you think investors investing into raw materials and supplies like nickel copper cobalt and other minerals yes so there is a lot of raw, there are a lot of raw materials required in the future much much more than we thought in the past and that is driven by the and it's so-called energy transition so there's a huge opportunity in terms of investing in supply of some of these what we call clean minerals, mm -hmm. nickel, copper, lithium, rare earth, right? Uh, mag magnesium, there's so many things. And uh, Indonesia is at the core of this, at least when it comes to nickel. Mm -hmm. So I see a big, big potential in those markets. Oh, okay. So because the demand increases dramatically. Demand, of course, demand increases dramatically. Everyone is talking about electric vehicle. Even you know, in European countries, I notice whenever you go to the airport, you have to ride on an EV car. And right now, I think in in, in Jakarta, they're starting to implement that, but not as fast as in European countries. Yeah, I mean, look, electric vehicles have a place in the world, uh, and especially in, in, in cities like Jakarta, mm -hmm. you know, to reduce um, actual pollution, actual um, um, particle emissions, mm -hmm. electric vehicles, you know, make sense. But don't, but don't believe electric vehicles are clean. It's not as clean as we thought? No, of course not, because you just talked about the raw mineral materials, minerals yes. required to build to those. Build. And where do they come from? And what energy do you use? to process these min minerals. So it's still, they use the coal and the oil and the gas? Of course. <laughs> okay. So now we know about that. And so last recently, we just launched an Indonesian carbon trading exchange. It's all very new to us. Do you know much about it? Yes, I've heard that Indonesia started now also an exchange where uh, people or companies can start to trade CO2. Well. As per my understanding, the purpose of, of pricing CO2 
and you price CO2 easier by having an exchange where you can buy and sell CO2. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of that is actually to, number one, fund the energy transition, the so-called transition. And uh, number two is um, to, to shift or give incentive to move away from high CO2 emitting energy sources mm -hmm. towards primarily wind and solar. Okay, so this will benefit alternative energies company who are also listed in the stock exchange and perhaps like the other companies that still not listed in the stock exchange. So correct. So think about it. If you if you're pricing an element, in this case CO2, that will have economic and envi environmental consequences. The economic consequences are that companies that are in the business of wind and solar, which is considered zero CO2, which by the way is not correct, um, are basically getting a boost because their products now are relatively cheaper than let's say coal or gas or oil. The, the issue of forcing pricing CO2 is that it causes distortions. It causes market distortions because CO2 is not a natural product. It is a product but it's actually driven by government policy. It's not like buying and selling a computer, right? You're buying and selling a, a product which is driven by a government policy. Now doing that supposedly is supposed to help the transition and it's supposed to save our climate. But the assumptions behind that CO2 pricing scheme are wrong, unfortunately. For instance, wind and solar are not zero CO2 mm. and EV is not zero CO2. Yes. And CO2 is the basis for life. More CO2, more plants. So we are made of carbon. 16% of our body is carbon. Right. The carbon comes from the atmosphere, from the CO2. So CO2 has issues or has, 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 has concerns and CO2 has benefits, but nobody counts those benefits. So I am looking at the macroeconomic impact of what pricing CO2 has in Europe and in China and in Indonesia, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I have concerns. Okay. You're from Germany, right? Mm -hmm. So I heard German is now in recessions already. Mm -hmm. How is uh, your country condition? I think when you travel to Germany, it looks fine. It's a beautiful country with yes. amazing people. But the fact is that the economy has been in a recession almost for a year now. Uh, and that recession, in my view, is primarily driven by exactly high costs of energy. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the, the energy prices have been increasing for 20 years. So as Germany has been transitioning to so-called clean and so-called cheap wind and solar, actually what it has done, it has by now sevenfold increased the cost of electricity. Wow, sevenfold. Yes, because we have so much so-called cheap wind and solar now. Mm -hmm. Because it's wind and solar increased the total cost of energy. Yeah, correct. And, so and, and that has implications for in the, uh, people yeah. and for industries. Yeah. Because industries, especially uh, energy uh, heavy industries and uh, industries that require a lot of energy are going to move out to where energy is cheaper. Hmm. So how does that affect the other part of the world? The world is definitely in the beginning of a long term energy crisis. Absolutely. In the beginning of a long term, long -term energy, energy crisis. crisis. Yes. So, 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 I mean, you know, we have energy available to us, but energy is becoming scarcer, less reliable and more expensive. Mm -hmm. And that has an implication for the entire world. But the, the issues about energy are very different in different countries. So for instance, the US has a lot of resources, a lot of gas and coal resources. Mm -hmm. China has a huge amount of resources as well. So China has its own issues. But um, Europe does play an important role when it comes to demand and also does play an important role when it comes to, to the perception right, of how the world is. When Europe is in trouble, the world perceives you know, unhappy, uh, even though Europe is just 10%, right? But it's, it's an important um, aspect of, of, of how the world sentiment yes. is. So here as an investor, I want to ask you, where do you think we should put our money when it comes to energy? So the question is, where will the returns be? Right? Where will you have high returns? Correct. Um, well, I can tell you that the returns in so-called clean technologies will diminish. They will go down. Okay. Why? Because there's so much money going in there. Mm -hmm. Right? Too much money gives, that means the returns are being comp competed away. What is lacking money? 
What's lacking money is 80% of energy, oil, coal, and gas. Mm -hmm. There's not enough money there. What does it mean when there's not enough money? That means the returns go up, you make more money. Yeah, that's right. So that's where you should put your money. And you see, there is an environmental aspect to this. Yes. Because you're putting your money into what actually provides 80% of our energy. And that money will also help to make this cleaner. Filter technology, newest power plants, all those things which are required. Okay, so where us traders here, we want to know where do you think coal price will go? <laughs> That's always a big question. <laughs> I would know that. I would be on the beach, right? <laughs> um, look, short term, there is going to be a lot of swings up and down. And there's many, many aspects that you have to consider. Long term, I'm rather bullish. Mm -hmm. So um, very much, a lot of in the future depends on gas. We will see a large influx of new gas projects coming online, coming online, which will force coal prices or put pressure on coal prices. But again, fundamentally, because of a mismatch in in uh, investments, I am rather bullish on coal long term. Short term, I cannot tell you it's going to go up and down a lot. Yes. And next year, if the economic crises in Europe and potentially even in China are getting more concerning, then of course that will push a Put, will put pressure also on coal. So this is the unpopular truth, which is very popular book. <laughs> <laughs> and this is your recent one. You just gave me a coal handbook. Why do you write so many books about this? And this is actually quite amazing. I read it. I, I flicked through it. Not reading the whole thing is quite technical, but I think it's very useful for university students, for us um, coal investors or research analysts in coal and Tell us a little bit more about this unpopular truth. Well, so I've been working in the commodity industry for about 20 years now. And um, in my job, I travel around the world. Yes. And uh, when I am in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, and I, and I see how little energy hundreds of millions of people consume compared to where I am from in Germany or in Switzerland or in Europe, mm -hmm. I question where will this energy come from in the future? And that makes me think, well, what are we going to do about the future of energy? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I start to question, okay, everybody talks about the energy transition towards wind and solar. Mm -hmm. So I question, can we supply the energy required with what we are told? And that is basically the cause of, you know, why I write this book. I want to understand where the future energy comes from. Thank you so much for your very insightful information, Lars. I hope to see you again next time while you visit Jakarta. Thank Pleasure you for coming. Here. Thank you.